So my talk is going to be about uh, the implementation of Zanya uh, algebra in Kelo NFS, which indeed uses the and I'm going to focus mainly on the big thing, which is uh, the matrix times vector multiplication, which is a core operation which happens next. Uh, I also plan to give some, some information on LinGen, which is the middle step in Blockbit uh, Fans, which is a matrix where I get my system and uh, what we see when I get the Okay, so some context elements, uh, which I'm not going to give many, many, many details about. Uh, the thing is that uh, I am interested in the problems arising in the context of the number field field algorithm which is used to factor integers. So in this context, uh, what I want is a solution of a linear system defined over F2, and I want uh, actually uh, an element of the left null space of some matrix. Uh, if you want, you can rephrase this at uh, the expense of the transpose of the matrix. And uh, I guess uh, for this audience, it's pretty tri trivial to mention that, uh, of course, it's not the same stuff as we see. Um, not everybody is aware of this. Uh, for example, uh, this kind of shape, which is uh, which could be typical in some uh, PDE computation, is not alone at all with the one I am encountering. So on the right, uh, this is the shape of matrices I'm considering in the context of factorization problems. So this matrix actually is uh, a view on the FSA 768 uh, linear system. Uh, except that it does not contain uh, the following information. It's a 2,000 by 2,000 picture, and every pixel represents a 100,000 times 100,000 block. And the gray level denotes the number of non zero coefficients in there. So, an average on this matrix, matrix which has 300 million rows and columns, I have 140 non zero coefficients per row. So, by sparse here, I mean it one and zero coefficient in the median. Uh, okay. How do you take to make that picture? Uh, <laughs> the file is 100 gigabytes. So it's exactly the time it takes to read the file. Depends on your hard disk. Uh, okay, so given the size of the matrix, uh, anything which touches the matrix is uh, basically forbidden. So you have to use a black box algorithm. <coughs> Uh, and this is the only way you, you are allowed to access your matrix. Uh, so it means you have to focus on adapted algorithms, which are for the simplest ones, the Langshaws and Biderman algorithms. Unfortunately, these are completely unsuitable to computations of F2 because uh, there is a trade of probability which is one for the size of the field, so it's extremely tempting for F2. So if you want to use block algorithms, uh, uh, it has advantages like you can take better advantage of the hardware for computation. It's uh, easy to work with blocks of 64 bits. Uh, for instance, I mean, you might uh, discuss on, uh, whether a block width of 64 or 128 or 32 is better, it depends. Uh, but 64 is a good start. Because I'm working with F2. So the big question is uh, what are the algorithms? So I mentioned the block Biedemann algorithm, it's not the only one. There's also the block Langshaw's algorithm. Uh, the two algorithms do not have the same complexity. Uh, and in the complexity of block Biedemann here, I'm introducing uh, two parameters, n and n prime. And n prime here means the number of dependent computations I'm going to. Uh, do, while n is some sort of intrinsic uh, blocking factor which <coughs> is related to your hardware, so let's say 64. So block Wiedemann gives you the opportunity of parallel, parallelizing more. Uh, if you have a large cluster, uh, maybe you can afford uh, using block Langshaws with n somewhat large, uh, but uh, if you have many medium-sized clusters, which is kind of common, uh, you are better off using the 
So the bug VDMI is now preferred for factorization computations exactly because of this. We have more 64 nodes uh, clusters in uh, departments uh, all over the world than we have uh, 1,000 nodes clusters with uh, very, very large interconnect. Uh, this is a more expensive resource and much harder to find. So we rather go with this. Okay, so what is the H2 with plug feed demand? There are essentially uh, two types of operations. Uh, the first and the last steps of the, of the plug feed demand algorithm essentially boil down to doing matrix times vector product. So plug feed demand is an iterative algorithm, and the thing you are interested in is, are the terms from the sequence x principles times power of n, uh, so k times some vector of y. Actually, x and y are blocks of vectors. So this uh, x principles and the k y are matrices of size and n prime times and n prime. Uh, so this, this, uh, this means doing many matrix times vector products. And the middle step is what I call ninja. It's the matrix product competency step or matrix electricity, whatever you refer to. Regarded as. Okay, so the most important thing to remember about, about Black Pinnaman is I mean, I'm not going to, to give you a complete detail about Black uh, but there's one thing to know that by the structure of this algorithm, uh, it's possible to do many uh, parts of the computation independently because <coughs> here in this uh, matrix, if I split Y into vertical parts, uh, each vertical part of matrix A bar only depends on the corresponding vertical part of the initial vector of Y. So there is no dependence between column 47 of Y and column 12 of matrix A, whatever. These are completely independent. So it's very important to know. And because of this, it's possible to do uh, block VMM computation with one cluster in France, one cluster in Switzerland, and one cluster in Japan which is exactly what we did for IVSS 768. So uh, this is something extremely important. Of course, the bottleneck of this approach is that uh, the more clusters you use independently in the first step, the more pressure you have on the matrix product in the step of the one. But uh, this is something uh, which can be dealt with. Okay, so uh, I've shown you images of um, matrices for factoring problems. And this appears with a band of very dense uh, columns at the beginning. Uh, but the problem is that most often I, I talk about matrix times vector product, but uh, there's a slight mishap here. That I'm trying to solve, to, I'm searching for something in the left corner space. It means that the black box I'm interested in, interested in is uh, vector times matrix black box. So, given the fact that I'm usually Talking about matrix times vector, it's better to uh, to say that I'm uh, that I'm actually thinking about a matrix which has uh, this shape uh, with instead dense rows at the beginning and sparsely increasing. Uh, of course, on with real data, you are not going to to change anything. It's just a position of my with the shape you know, of the matrix we are talking about. Uh, okay, so there are two uh, contexts of optimization I'm going to talk about, which are the ones uh, which happen when you are doing MPI, and distribute your matrix across uh, many machines, and the one which pertain to what happens uh, on one CPU precisely. Uh, so, uh, so as I said, matrices I'm considering are somewhat big. So this is the data uh, of the RSA 768 matrix. It's 100 gigs uh, if you store it uncompressed, and 75 if you use some sort of compressed format. It's not it's not JSON uh, compression. It's uh, only some hack to. To, to get some savings on the low coefficient uh, footprint. Uh, 
So you, you, you can obtain a 75 mix bag, but uh, still, you know, it's a heavy matrix. And for such a heavy matrix, <coughs> computing matrix times vector is of course a lot of work, uh, starting from the fact that uh, reading 75 gigs in memory is already kind of it's somewhere. So it's sensible to use many processors if, if you can and uh, uh, try to see whether this is going to, to be an advantage or not, uh, given the fact that using many processors or many machines uh, incur, incurs some communication costs. So this is something classical. You want you have a big matrix. You want to distribute it across several nodes, and of course you have to address the issue of uh, communication between nodes. And the question is how you do that, and how you do uh, decent uh, exploitation of the high bandwidth, bandwidth uh, interconnects you may have, like in Finiband, maybe net or whatever. So in this context, I regard uh, something like uh, gigabit Ethernet as being dog slow. Any cluster uh, with gigabit Ethernet is almost unusable for. Okay, so yeah, so there could be several ways to split my matrix uh, on many nodes. So suppose I am using a cluster of 64 nodes and I organize uh, the nodes virtually in a mesh of dimension 8 times 8. And the question is who gets what? Uh, as part of the matrix, so there is an obvious silly answer is uh, just do a geographic partitioning of the matrix uh, node 0 gets the upper left corner and node 63 gets the bottom right corner and uh, very obviously it's uh, extremely bad uh, because uh, the workload for this node is going to be many orders of magnitude larger than the workload for that node so this is something we want to avoid from the geometry of this it's possible to uh, introduce some balancing, uh, like uh, we can sort columns and distribute them uh, quite evenly, so this creates a permutation matrix and do the same for rows. And because solving this problem or this problem are essentially reducible to one another, uh, not, not a big issue for us. So we can instead uh, consider a splitting which would resemble this. Uh, okay, so is this um, problem solved? Well, not really, actually, because it's much beyond this. Uh, yeah, so you could distinguish between uh, what happens uh, between several nodes and between the different roles of the node. It's, uh, I'm going to get this concerned out of the way. Uh, yeah, the, the balancing goes much beyond this because in the context of Block Wiedemann I said that I, I really praise the fact that I can work with uh, many clusters independently and uh, I want of course the computation of these different clusters to be compatible with each other and uh, given the fact that I consider this situation where I have access to different uh, clusters, maybe I could uh, have to change from one cluster to another and uh, while at the beginning I was working with 64 nodes, maybe I would have to work with 49 nodes instead uh, afterwards and uh, I want to do this switch in a compatible manner. So it means that there is a slight difficulty because my transposition matrices are dependent in the mesh size. If I have 8 times 8 mesh, the transposition matrices I'm going to use for proper balancing are not the same as for another mesh. So it's, a, it's a, an important problem because the two, the two sequences I would compute in this context are incompatible. So I need to do something about that. Fortunately, it's pretty easily solved. Uh, because in my context, the standard deviation of the weights of rows and columns are very, very different. So, the standard deviation of the, the weight 
of uh, equivalent and effective matrix or both uh, equivalent fact that I changed the, the orientation. Uh, it's much larger uh, than for worlds. Uh, so I can first compute a nice balancing for the ones which are most unbalanced and then uh, use just the conjugate balancing for the rest. So it means that then, because these are conjugates, it's possible to, to make uh, sequences which are compatible with each other, and uh, that's, that's a, a win. So it means that I only need to do a change of coordinates when I start my job and my cluster, uh, and otherwise it's, it's fully compatible. That's okay, so uh, given this balancing, how do I uh, work with many nodes in parallel and what is, what is the work I have to do uh, to communicate data uh, between nodes. So I suppose that I'm working with a square mesh of size t times t. So in reality, this, the mesh doesn't have to be square, but uh, let's say it's going to be approximately square. For this slide, let's say it's square. Uh, and I'm going to disregard uh, the elevation with course because it's nodes, uh, same way only with nodes. So what does uh, node position ij do? It has actually a fraction which is one over t one over t of the input vector. It has to compute some local product and uh, for the matrix times vector product having computing, computed this local product it has afterwards to sum up this contribution with the contribution of all of the nodes uh, situated in the same row in my mesh. So it has to do a collective operation, which is an addition across a row. It has to be accumulated, and then I need to do some broadcast because the resulting vector should be used for the next iteration of block Wiedemann. Uh, the part of the resulting vector has to be broadcasted to every node on the column. Uh, graphically, uh, this is what we get. Uh, suppose I have my mesh of nodes. These are fragments of the input vector which are known to each node in a column. The first step is the local multiplication. So this implies no communication at all, of course. And then I have to do this reduction operation across rows. And in MPI speak, this is called MPI reduce. Uh, so I can do this and obtain the sum on the node I elect uh, to receive the sum. So it seems sensible to do this because for the next step I have to do a broadcast and this is what's going to happen. And the operation in an MPI language is an MPI broadcast. Uh, and then the next input vector is actually now to each node in the column. So uh, it's uh, pretty easily stated, uh, but it's also some, somewhat simplistic because there are downside, downsides. Like uh, for reduction, the input output work is not balanced across nodes. This job, this node, has more work to do than the others. And uh, this, this is so. For each code. So, if I use an algorithm where each node communicates its contribution to its neighbor in a, in a circular, circular fashion, then uh, uh, so in terms of latency, there is a, a ratio of 1, over 1 to n in terms of uh, the work amount for each, uh, each node here. So, it's not very cool. And even if I use something which uh, uses a hypercube uh, setup, for instance, it's still one of our login, so, so it's, it's not, not very cool. And it's exactly the same for the MPID cast uh, situation. Uh, in theory, some, uh, some interconnects do allow an operation which is called multicast, where you are supposed to have some time uh, broadcasting your data to many nodes. Uh, in practice, uh, I don't think the infiniband multicast, for instance, is used in MPI, MPI, MPI implementations. 
they're not exactly fulfilled the constraints uh, which are needed by uh, the MPA interface, so it, it's a bit of uh, And uh, the bottom line is that uh, we encounter the same issue with broadcast as we have with reduce. So there's an obvious answer to this. Uh, if we have some imbalance, uh, then it would be better to parallelize on the work so that the imbalance gets uh, distributed. So instead of having a reduction which puts data on one node, we are going to do a reduction which puts data on all nodes of the world and get this uh, in a nicely, evenly balanced manner. So it means that uh, on each row, uh, one node is going to collect a part which has size 1 over t squared of the destination vector. So it means uh, I would get a scheme like this, uh, a collective operation uh, of size 1 fourth here uh, with destination this node, and a collective operation with destination this node, and so on and so forth. And the self four collective operations can actually be achieved by a single algorithm which completely avoids uh, this idea of having a latency on one of the nodes and the other nodes waiting for it. Uh, so it's, it's useful enough to actually be defined in the MPI dialect as something which is called MPI reduce scatter, uh, meaning that the result is scattered across uh, the rows taking part of the, the nodes taking part of the computation. And for the converse operation, which is uh, analog to broadcast, then I have also a name which is all gather. And it's basically the same thing, uh, the same way to implement the stuff. Unfortunately, uh, there are also uh, there is also a slight problem. So it, it, does, it does get uh, a significant speed up. So uh, I don't have comparisons, uh, but yeah, I would have loved to, to provide you with data uh, how much speed up I get with parallelized collectives. Uh, but it, it's significant, like, like a factor of two on the, uh, on the communication part is something uh, very difficult. Um, so there's a slight problem with this approach of uh, using parallelized uh, collectives is that uh, if I look at things precisely, uh, we discover that in fact, uh, even uh, assuming local multiplication are the identity, I don't get the identity uh, when I'm doing this uh, computation. If I follow what happens, my vector coefficients are moved in a transposition transposition map like uh, coefficient coordinate in position pi plus j after this reduce scalar plus uh, all gather and then at coordinate tj plus i in my destination vector. It's a bit odd. This is what happens. So it needs that I get instead of working with a matrix m, I am working with a matrix some sigma depending on t times m. So it means that my transposition uh, depends on the mesh size and uh, gets in the way and prevents me from uh, actually doing something, uh, doing the thing I wanted to. Okay, so uh, it's a bit, uh, so there's some headaches, uh, but it's not, nothing uh, impossible to work with. And yeah, uh, that's for square meshes. Uh, but for rectangular meshes, it's even worse. So I'm uh, avoiding the nasty details about this, but uh, you can imagine that. Uh, uh, okay, so if I want to counter the transposition effect, essentially I'm going to do the same trick as before, but uh, taking into account uh, single G matrix. So instead of choosing S equals uh, T inverse, then I'm going to choose S uh, inversing it. Both T and single G, and this is going to work. Uh, so this has been implemented in Kano NFS for about a year and a half now. And this was already used for IVC 768 uh, back in 2009. Uh, okay, so that's it about, uh, it's almost it about MPI.
API level optimization. So yeah, the executive summary is that uh, it's important to, to do parallelized API characters. Uh, it's important to think about balancing. And uh, it's also annoying to notice how much noise this uh, whole thing adds to the code. Uh, because uh, it, it means a lot of stuff. So some example data. For a matrix, uh, for so what was it? Uh, yeah, some factory matrix, uh, not a not a very big one. Uh, yeah, it's for every system. Uh, the so communication cost using this uh, scheme is about a quarter to to thirty percent of the total. Uh, so I am spending on sixty four nodes. I am spending more on local notifications than I am spending on communication. So it's pretty nice uh, because it means that uh, I, I make good use of my 64 nodes. And, yeah. So it, uh, an important information I have uh, forgot to put on this slide that the interconnect between these nodes is infinite by 20 gigs, 20 gigabits. Uh, so it's, yeah. That the uh, most expensive you can get. Uh, the common fast interconnect uh, you will get nowadays if you want a breakfast. Uh, the similar figure for f 768 uh, which was uh, already three years back, uh, is the communication. So it is the same ballpark. Okay, so that's it for MPI level. So now uh, a few words about what happens. Uh, for the local notifications, so what happens on each CPU, and uh, in fact on each CPU core. So, uh, let's see. If I think about my RSA 768 matrix, it has this 200 million rows and columns and 27 million non zero coefficients. And let's say it's typical to consider the case where this matrix is split across uh, 144 jobs, uh, each in separate CPU calls, organized in a mesh size 12 times so, and 12 times 12. So it means that each of the sub matrices I'm going to consider has an average 12 non zero coefficients per row and size 16 million uh, rows and columns. So it's very small. And also, it means that the matrix data is uh, in the area of one gig, one gigabytes uh, per core. So, okay, so this is the, the kind of work I want to do. And uh, considering this, I also must not forget the fact that the other cores on my machines are presumably also doing uh, the same thing at the, at the same moment. So. Uh, well, for benchmarking, uh, it's important to, to do benchmarks uh, for, the, for the whole picture and not for what happens only for one core alone. Because the fact that several cores may be doing the same thing uh, at the same moment means that there's going to be some congest congestion with respect to caches uh, and mem memory buses and so on and so forth. It's, it's something uh, to think about. So given this number of non-zero coefficients per row, uh, we could imagine that anything pertaining to the dense strip of the matrix has limited relevance. And uh, that's indeed true. Uh, but still, we, we may do something about uh, the not so sparse strips. And in comparison to matrices occurring in many other contexts, uh, in this context, I do not have uh, we have which are structurally zero, like matrices I consider are not uh, upper triangular in any way, for instance, or uh, almost like not in any way. No. So, so there is no we have the matrix where I know that I have nothing to do. I have work to do, sometimes <laughs> little work, but work to do everywhere. Okay, so uh, what about doing things a stupid way? Uh, so if I want to do things uh, slow, uh, I could do something like this. 
So imagine I have an array indicating the weights uh, of each row. And uh, aside this, another array indicating uh, where are the non zero coefficients in each row. So these are the current indices of non zero coefficients. So with this code, I am doing a matrix times vector product. Uh, and it's bad because uh, this column and these indices of uh, non zero coefficients are really um, the, the, the jump all over the, the, the set of kind of indices, so I'm going to pay load misses, uh, deep load misses, uh, basically at n9. Furthermore, I'm in a situation where I said I have an even row width, uh, so a strip of dense rows at the top, and rows getting sparser and sparser near the end. So it means that uh, at the end I have maybe uh, say half of my rows with uh, less than three uh, non-zero coefficients, and if I do this, uh, it means that my loop here is going to run uh, less than three times. So the relative, the relative cost of the prediction of this branch is going to be high. So it's not a penalty with this scheme. So it's it's bad for two reasons. It's also possible to, so this, this would be reading the coefficient of the matrix in your major order. So it's also possible to read coefficients of the matrix in column major order. Uh, wait, uh, yes, right. So if I read coefficients in column major order, so I have the way of taking the weight of each column. And I can do this, uh, which also does, does the matrix times vector product. Uh, so, the, since the weights are more balanced for columns than for rows, uh, maybe I will have less penalty related to branch with prediction here. But on the other hand, uh, this is also uh, jumping all over the place. Uh, so I'm going to face door misses uh, for each equation, so, so it's, yeah, it's also expensive. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one thing to avoid is to imagine that uh, there is one singular algorithm which is going to work for any, uh, any size of matrix uh, I'm going to consider, uh, even in this context of integer factorization. Uh, Sipa was saying uh, yesterday that uh, he proposes to, to store the matrix coefficients in the order where they are used, and it's something important. Uh, here we have uh, the freedom of doing this as well, and also uh, defining the order in which the coefficients are used, and we are going to do that. To do that, we are going to spend some time deciding what is the best way uh, to process the matrix data, in which order am I going to consider my coefficients, uh, and, and this going to do so for different zones of the matrix, possibly different. And so I'm going to have a specialized algorithm for each zone. So I need to define separation criteria between my zones, like uh, whether it's uh, sparse, below, or above a certain threshold, and uh, some uh, guiding principles uh, to also be used, like splitting my zones into uh, the of some given width. Okay, so I'm going to present you uh, a couple of algorithms uh, which appear in uh, Hello NFS. Uh, a slight disclaimer is that uh, the algorithms are, are sound and uh, somewhat good, but uh, there's always room for further optimization and uh, there's no good auto tuning with Hello NFS like we have a couple of hash defines here and there. Uh, which should optimally be related uh, to your machine, but uh, currently are playing hash defined uh, constants, uh, so it could be much better. Uh, and uh, there is some assembly, but uh, it could be optimized uh, much better. Okay, so I said that 
there are probably uh, very few uh, dense areas, but let's say there are not those parts. And maybe we could do something special about that. Uh, so, in Kelly FS, we have currently two algorithms, uh, and the one is really nothing extremely special, uh, like it's uh, using blocks of 216 rows and columns, like uh, people are doing. Uh, and so there's a cost of about 4 bytes uh, per non zero coefficient. And in such blocks, I'm processing coefficients in column major order. And the so called uh, small tube format is the concrete version of the ladder. Uh, and it, uh, it's restricted to 4,000 rows. And it constrains delta j, so what we call delta j. Delta J has to be at root 16. Uh, delta J is the number of consecutive columns in my block with no non zero coefficient. Okay. So I want to store uh, differences in, in terms of coordinate between consecutive non zero coefficients, and I want these differences in terms of uh, span of current indices to not exceed uh, 16. And for somewhat dense scripts, uh, it's uh, possible to, to do that. <coughs> uh, and uh, the upshot is that uh, I get only two bytes per non zero coefficient. It's a slight plus. It's seldom used, but uh, sometimes it works. So that's for the not so sparse uh, areas. And uh, there are more algorithms in KNFS. <coughs> so there's another one which for the large uh, formats, uh, which was, uh, I'm not going to give many details about this because it's not extremely important since it does not mean, it does not mean so often uh, for the next format. But there is uh, still a very important guiding idea in this format is that it introduces, it introduces a two pass algorithm for doing the matrix multiplication. The idea is that I have uh, I'm going to read my coefficients and instead of I, I'm going to read coefficients from the source vector according to from where I have to read them and uh, instead of uh, when reading, things, reading, reading them instead of immediately adding them to my destination vector I'm going to store this coefficient in some to-do list somewhere like this coefficient I copied from the source vector, I put it in some buffer, and someday I return back to it, and I'm going to copy or add this coefficient uh, to the proper place in the destination vector. And when reading the coefficient data from the source vector, I'm going to consider several to-do lists uh, for several buffers which are going to be filled uh, at the same time. So this step actually uh, it depends on the characteristic of the CPUs, which is the number of so-called TLB buffers. Uh, and it, it can, proper tuning of such behavior has to consider TLBs, and it's not extremely uh, easy. But it is also the thing which makes uh, this algorithm work. Uh, okay, so for the record, there are details in the four next slides about the large format, but I'm going to skip uh, this four slides. Uh, as I said, uh, yes. Uh, no, I'm not using uh, fetch. I can tell you for sure. Uh, maybe there is some fetch in the SMB. Uh, I tried. Um, there, been, there have been some random mutation, mutations of the SMB. So at some point there was some fetch. It's also possible to do non-temporal moves uh, for these buffers. So everything is possible. But my assembly is not extremely good. Uh, for the large format, uh, there is uh, one thing is that because of my uneven row width situation, I have uh, my rows which are um, my, my, my buffers which are organized, say, in column, and 
they are going to fill up unevenly uh, because of this uneven row width situation. So there is another format which is precisely designed to address this issue. And this is the one I'm going to focus on uh, because it's more important than the other format. Uh, okay, so it's called VSC, which is a bizarre name. Uh, it means that if I describe what happens uh, graphically, uh, I would say it's in the still case of virtual staircase appearing, so that's a deviation to the new product. So I'm considering a band of, well, a, a, a strip of uh, up to 216 columns. And this is going to be split into two separate bands uh, according to average density. So uh, let's say I'm going to consider a first band with average density D. And when the average density uh, drops to roughly half of the average density above, I'm going to consider a second band. So uh, is there a marker somewhere? Yeah. This one? I think the last one. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, if I have my matrix, uh, I'm going to split uh, a given band of 216 currents into uh, my, my strip of 216 currents in different bands, and I'm going to do the same split that I'm going to read the coefficients in, uh, in this block in row major order. And uh, but when reading these coefficients, uh, I know exactly where I have to store this coefficient in a buffer which is exactly adapted to this small uh, block. And because this one is the first band, and because it's the densest, it's going to fill up pretty really quickly. So just after having filled this block, uh, let's say, it's a simplifying uh, scheme, but let's say I'm going to flush uh, the buffer, meaning I'm going to apply immediately. So this is what I'm doing for the densest of my bands. And next, I'm going to fill this one. And not flush because it's it's false. So I keep my buffer aside and not apply it right away. And then I proceed still using the same set of the system coefficients. So in fact, the flush here appears on the bottom. Uh, and say so it's it's not so dense though, so it's going to be flushed uh, later. And so on and so forth. And next. I'm going to do this one, it's going to be flushed immediately, and then do this one. So append to the previous data, which was still in the buffer, because on the previous uh, pass it was not flushed. And because it has average density, uh, one half of the previous one, then now I have approximately the same number of coefficients stored in my buffer from what I had before, so it, maybe it's time to flush, and I'm going to pay about the same cost, uh, so uh, that's the moment where I flush this buffer. And this one is going to be flushed, uh, let's say, so I have a geometric progression, so let's say I'm going to flush it here, and uh, this one uh, maybe somewhat later. So th this is uh, the, the idea uh, for this VSC algorithm. And uh, the format which is used is exactly adapted to the order in which I am reading my coefficients. Uh, like uh, when filling my buffer, my buffer, the only thing I need is just to know uh, where are the column indices upon the coefficients I'm encountering. And when applying the buffers, I'm just grabbing a buffer from memory, and I need to know uh, whether I'm grabbing actually. Uh, yeah several sub and I need to know 
uh, what are the coefficients to be added to coordinate uh, zero of my extension vector would be one and one. So this uh, data has to come from several of my buffers in this situation, um, two and the situation four. So I have to provide some combiner uh, information which is a small integer. So this is how the format uh, goes. How much time do I have? Yes, so uh, if, you, if you want to answer questions, then okay. we will answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is about this VSC format. So this is uh, the last time I really touched the internals uh, of the matrix times vector uh, multiplication in Kelo NFS. So it dates back to 2009, actually. Uh, and uh, I guess there's still room for improvement with this implementation. But it's already quite nice. Uh, so as I said, the large format uh, I skipped over uh, is generally not so efficient, but um, it's not as clear in some cases. Uh, the large format uh, it's, it's not, uh, not exactly. Okay, so I given the, the fact of yeah, that I had several algorithms, I need to do some work for organizing my matrix. So I need to at least try to create some dense strips and have some abort conditions like, uh, okay, I'm going to proceed creating uh, somewhat dense strips until uh, the point where my density is going to fall below some threshold. Until the point where, uh, because of my format, uh, some assumption is going to being uh, then I can switch to another format, so I like raise the large slices, which could be uh, forgotten about for the first read. And for example, next I switch to my BSC format, and I need to decide on the width of the bands and uh, construct the matrix data, and eventually uh, Y to the data. Okay, so I had some experimental data. Uh, an example matrix. So I have taken some matrix which is about the size that you would uh, handle on a CPU or on, or on one core if you want. So it's one which is directly from an integer of acquisition program for 166. 166 digit numbers. So it has 15 million rows and columns and about 116 and zero coefficient growth. And I expanded my experimental uh, tests by some other matrix data, which is some simulated data, which has the same dimension, so it's directly derived from the previous. But uh, I am just keeping uh, one coefficient uh, every six. Uh, randomly and uh, discarding the others. So in effect I'm creating a matrix which is sparser uh, and what does this operation represent? Actually it represents what I would get if I had a matrix six times larger uh, but split with a mesh of size six times six. So it's easier than to actually handle uh, several dozens of gigabytes and a matrix file and split it and so on and so forth. It simulates uh, data, but it is still uh, something reasonable. So I'm using <coughs> a 12 core uh, load uh, with the ones L640, and the frequency is not that high. So the techniques I get uh, for this factoring matrix, uh, C166, are given here in cycles per non-zero coefficient. So how do I interpret this? Well, what I get is the fact that by using my small format, which is a simple uh, way of uh, taking uh, blocks of cycles to 16 times to 16, I get something which is already quite decent. 
uh, more than a factor of two over the number approach, uh, and it's already quite nice. And if I introduce, if I use instead only the format of that, uh, I get something slower. And if I combine those, I get something sensible about the, the way we are switched from one to the other, uh, I get something weird, but not uh, dramatic. Uh, the important thing to notice is that uh, this example is, in a sense, mis misleading because uh, for state-of-the-art computation, we are not so much concerned about uh, what happens with this size of matrices, but rather for matrices much, much larger. Like the one uh, such matrix would be part of, okay. Uh, and for this, uh, small part of a bigger, bigger matrix, uh, what I gain with my 2 to the 16 and 10 to the 16 blocks uh, is still significant over the, the stupid approach. Uh, my VSC format is now uh, longer expensive compared to the other one, but the combination does gain uh, about 25% over the just uh, only blocks of watch, and uh, I, I claim that there is still room for improvement um, in this approach for so, uh, it's missing. Uh, okay, so yeah, now for, for Lingen, I think uh, it has a too many. Same logic would be used. 
Uh, and for about two years now, it's actually available in some Intel CPUs, the latest ones. Uh, but the stupid thing is that it's slower uh, by several order of magnitude than integer multiplication. But uh, at, at least it's there. Uh, and this is important because uh, it has an effect, an effect in the overall performance. And uh, so I'm going to, to say a word about this, about this in the last slide about this experimental uh, data. And the other way to multiply matrices of polynomials is to uh, twist the problem over and uh, work instead with polynomials of matrices. Uh, so okay, it's not uh, immediate, but it's possible to pay attention. And it's also the same thing, which is called bit slicing. It means that uh, my bit by bit multiplication is transformed into matrix times matrix multiplication. And uh, this becomes the core operation, and I need to make this operation very fast. Uh, so uh, this was uh, my reason for comparing uh, what I could come up with in terms of uh, low-level code and compare with them for a while. Uh, because I'm focusing on matrices which are really, uh, very simple format, uh, I get something faster than for a while. Now I guess there's a margin is the same. It was not the uh, and, uh with this bit slicing approach, uh, we get polynomials with heavier uh, coefficient, and uh, it's possible to, to work coefficient by coefficient uh, uh, and take advantage of this. The experimental data I get uh, is that if I count the number of uh, cycles it takes, say to multiply uh, 64 by 64 matrix with polynomial entries of degree 64, so it, uh, of degree 63, 63, so it could be regarded as a building block. If I take two CPUs uh, and count the cycles, these are about the same, 2.6 million, uh, with the bit slice version. And uh, if I consider CPUs either with or without the PCI WPDQ, of course, this has a very important impact. So, for the old CPUs, uh, bit slicing uh, wins by far and large. For the more modern ones, it's not it's bit slicing still wins, but given the fact that there's a clear uh, room for improvement of the PCM and PQ introduction, the picture could be reversed uh, pretty soon. Okay, that's it.
only for, for some prime ideals and uh, zero for the rest, uh, you're actually going to get the zero solution. That's not going to work at all. Yet it's, it's a fine point of uh, computation, but it's really important. Any more questions? Before I have my next question, I need to run some code, so uh, perhaps in the software. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's thank the speaker again.